Welcome to another draft physics presentation. Yay. So, um, I figure I'll give this a shot because it really can't hurt. <laughs> um, might hurt you a little, but I mean, you know, all videos hurt a little bit. Uh, anyway, <laughs> um, the particle guru, um, Bob D. Hilster, uh, was, did a video on resistors and I found it had some interesting components and so I figured I would uh, opine. So the basic idea is, is apparently in physics there's a little bit of a problem because if you have two resistors in parallel, um, they um, somehow communicate with each other about what their real value should be. Now I never really ran into this, but I didn't do a whole lot of designing of circuits. I just did make it work kind of circuits. So I used a cheaper version of the mathematics, um, <laughs> you know, really cheap. Um, so how can R1 know the value of R2, and how does R2 know the value of R1 is the question being asked. And his solution is quite different than mine. So there's a mathematical equa equation that's kind of simple. You just multiply the two resistances and divide by the sum of the two resistances. So probably what the product div divided by the sum. I used to just do the cheat of you just add the two and divide by four. You know, first just add the two, uh, which, and then do a divide by two, which is, you know, basically finding the average of the two resistance numbers, and then you divide by two again because there's two resistors. So if there was three resistors, you would just change that second number and divide by three. <laughs> so you divide by five. But anyway, you'd obviously have to do the first number different too. I never did three three resistors, so <laughs> never came up. I mean, see, sometimes in circuits, what you do is you replace. You don't have a resistor, so you need a 25-ohm resistor, and you don't have one. So you manufacture one out of 250s, that kind of thing. Anyway, um, so, uh, so, so anyway, so he's answering a paradox, and so I thought I would just get to his, his answer to the paradox or the problem or the unexplained thing. And I'm not sure it's unexplained. And the math is weird, because if you do the math, if you do their math, math that's on the screen, this, the official math, and you use two resistors that have the same value, it works the same as my math. But if you if the values are different, then it comes out a little bit different, a little bit less. And I suppose that might be the problem. I'm not sure. I'm really not going to go research it. It's, it's not a subject I think is deep enough to be worth the trouble. So we'll go to the image. All right. So. That's basically something that I will think I will draw and then uh, uh, try to explain just how I think uh, Bob's solution can't possibly be a solution. So he has two kinds of forces in his, well, so far just two. Um, you have a, a big force, G1, that's photons and electrons, which doesn't quite make sense, but anyway. Uh, and then you have another force below that that somehow manipulates the the G1 force, which is essentially gravity also. I mean, the gravity we know about. Because he thinks there's another gravity below that that's moving the gravity, so to speak. Which, uh, you know, on its face, doesn't sound like that's going to work. So anyway, um, so he's basically saying that there are the G1s are what's going through the resistor, that's the electricity, and that the G2s are doing the communication between the resistors. I believe that's what he's saying. Um, or they're hitting the G1s and then the G1s are hitting each resistor or something like that. Anyway, the point is is that there's a force communicated between the resistors. I would argue you can kind of prove that wrong just by separating the resistors far enough away from each other, you know, opposite side of the circuit board, and the thing works exactly the same as long as the wires to the resistors are the same length, you'll get exactly the same result for your trouble. So it seems really unlikely that any force is communicating all the way across all the other components on the circuit board. So it just seems to me that this can't be the right answer, pretty much. Um, yeah, so uh, I think that's probably enough of a... This is really has to be a video for people who know something about circuits, I guess, because if you don't, I don't know. Well, it still could be value in it. 
there still could be somehow, maybe, possibly. Alright, anyway, to the drawing window. Mm, close enough. Doesn't look very focused, but it'll have to do. Um, Alright, so, resistors. To, and, okay, so I guess the first thing to understand is, okay, well, I'll draw the resistors and see if I can just draw that around that. Okay, so connected resistors, and so the idea of a resistor it sounds, it's sort of the wrong name, because it's, it doesn't really resist the flow of electricity as much as it just reduces the pressure, the voltage. So they're really voltage reducers, they're not resistors. Um, if you make them big enough, they can take as much, you know, as much as much uh, amperage as you want them to, as long as you keep making them big, 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 uh, then you can just push as much as you want through them, but the voltage will always drop the same amount for the resistance, uh, you know, the number of ohms of resistance will get you the same drop. Um, so they're really pressure reducers. And so, <clears throat> you know, it's another one of these problems where there's a lot of stuff in physics where <clears throat> they really just don't describe things exactly right. And we're just stuck with those poor descriptions. So the idea is you have voltages on the two sides here going to a battery. Um, so we'll just say this is a plus voltage of whatever, 10 volts. Um, doesn't really matter. So the thing to understand about voltage is that you can really only measure it by stopping it, having it clog. You know, so the reason why you could measure 10 volts here is because there's enough resistance, there's some resistance in this circuit. If there's no resistance, you're not going to be able to measure voltage, essentially. I, I mean, you can measure it on the battery, but I mean, you won't be able to find it in the conductor. You can't hit two places on the conductor. Yeah, you can't when it's, when it's connected. Because there's no resistance. You need resistance to create the difference, the voltage difference. Um, so if you measured across this resistor, you wouldn't get 10 volts. You'd get whatever the resistance lowering is. So if the, if the resistance, the pressure reduction, lowered the voltage to 8 volts here, well then you'd, you'd measure 2 volts across the resistor. That kind of thing. So anyway, so it's not really resisting. So he's basically saying that there's a external force that travels through the resistors and then it communicates back and forth to the resistors and somehow that controls how much resistance each resistor has. I would argue that it's just a pressure equation and that each resistor is creating a little bit of back pressure and that back pressure is determines what the shortest path is for any given electron. Every given electron is going to say where's my shortest path from here to here. It just wants to get from here to here and it wants the lowest pressure place to go to get it, to get there. And so if it goes one way it's a less resistance, okay, but the idea of reducing the pressure creates the same amount of pressure here. So it doesn't create the, you don't get to feel the effect at this end of the fact that this is the lower pressure rising path. So the fact that it has less resistance doesn't mean that the electricity just goes through the thing that has the least resistance. It goes through both resistors, even though they have a different value. So one could be 10 and one could be 20. 20 would be the more resistance, so you have to think of it backwards, but you can't read it, you can't see it anyway, so it doesn't matter. So one's just higher and one's lower in value. And the idea is the electricity doesn't go through one or the other because to it, it's feeling the fact that this is a converter. So all it's knowing is this is a resistor and that's all it has to know. And so the back pressure is always going to be the same. So <clears throat> how I would explain how electricity gets through this thing. So that's the other thing about um, Bob's theory is there's no real explanation of how the force you know, in my opinion, no good explanation for how the force actually travels without flying right out of the wire and all that kind of stuff. And so you hear about electrons being connected to electricity, and so I think the key is is that the electrons are the things that have the force between them, and that voltage is the idea of increasing.
pressure. And that's sort of something Bob and me probably could agree on. And so when you have electrons closer together, <clears throat> it means the stuff that's between the electrons is bouncing back and forth at a faster rate, and so there's more impacts hitting the electrons, and so there's more pressure. So the pressure is high when they're close together, and the pressure is low when they're further apart. So what's happening with voltage is, is that you're compressing the electrons or you're adding more dots between them. But either one of those two ways are the way you create more pressure between two electrons. And so higher voltage means higher pressure, means they're closer together or there's more little force bits between them, which creates more impacts on them, which gives them more desire to spread apart. And so all you're really doing when you go through a resistor is, let's just use an example, but the, the point would be is the electrons would have this specific distance between them going in, and when they come out, they have a, a wider distance between them. So essentially their, their pressure has been reduced by going through the resistor. So either some force was extracted, which I don't think happened, or <clears throat> the timing of the electrons to the force was changed. So in a sense you could imagine a way you could do that was you could have an electron, say two electrons are traveling into a machine of some kind and you let the first one go through without harassing it but the second one you slow it down, you put into a little loop or something to slow it down so there's a greater distance between the first one and the second one and that's essentially reducing the voltage. So it obviously this little circuit takes a little bit of time to do that, and so the electricity is slowed down as it goes through the resistor, and that's why the pressure outside the resistor is the same, because the amount of time it takes to do this change is the same amount of time, and so there's no, um, there's no quicker path, and therefore the electricity just tends to go through both resistors uh, at a somewhat even rate. Um, uh, it's probably a, a deeper answer to that, um, but I guess I would argue that you re the answer really has to be a mechanism, a, a feedback mechanism is created in the resistor itself. So while it's doing its conversion, when it's reducing the pressure, it's creating a message that goes back into the, the source, um, whether it's a tiny increase in pressure or a little extra force goes back, whatever it is, basically saying this path is being used, use the other path, kind of a, a, an idea. So one path doesn't get to consume all of the electricity, because the more it's sort of a relationship that exists. I mean, it's different for different materials, but generally speaking, for um, standard resistors, the the more voltage you put through it, the more it has, the more things it has, the more electricity it converts, the warmer it gets, and its in, its <laughs> its resistance increases, which means it attempts to strangle it more. Um, so there's definitely built-in feedback mechanisms in the materials themselves. Uh, so do I need to go any further? No point in making this a long video just to encourage uh, it to be watched. But anyway, so the, the, the objections I would have is, well, first, yeah, I don't think making two forces is a good idea. Um, you know, having a... Uh, so there's no way, I mean, it should, I guess the point is, is to, I mean, the idea of an electron being the same size as a photon doesn't work for me. So obviously, the, if you're going to say an electron is these things, that means you're saying basically it's a big group of them. But he sort of thinks a photon is a big group of little bits, which also sort of doesn't work. You know, you think they're like a whole series of waves of these, you know, where there's none and then there's some, and that's one photon. So one photon, in his theory, would be a bunch of little bits. Um, but the problem with that is that then if you're going to say there's another infinitesimally smaller force, which I obviously can't draw, 
that influences that force, it would have to influence every single one of all those little bits, and exactly the same, and that doesn't seem very hopeful, uh, in my opinion. So anyway, this is probably not very serviceable, but uh, I did it anyway, and such. What if it was worth? I think people have to uh, argue, <laughs> you know, about these different ideas, and to be able to recognize ones that are more viable than others and stuff like that. So that's all I'm doing. I'm not trying to harass anybody or anything. So anyway, till next time. And I think it's uh, probably there's probably something I should have gone over and I didn't, but. Uh, yeah, really. So amperage is basically just the volume of electrons that go through. Pressure is how close they are together. So voltage is how close the electrons are, or how much force is between them. And um, current uh, is the raw volume Yeah. of, I guess it has to be the little bits, not the electrons, but it seems pretty clear that it seems quite clear that most cases when you're creating electricity that they all have a standard amount of force between them. So it really is just about how close the electrons are. Because the electrons were created in the same place and have likely the same amount of force between them. So we're really just talking about compressing them with an external force and pushing them. And that's creating the pressure. There's electrons everywhere. I mean, even the places that don't have voltage have electrons. <laughs> so there's, you can't go somewhere in the material universe and find a place that has zero volts. So there's just, there's always electrons. So it's really just comparison of a voltage. You know, we could call something zero, but that's a thousand volts, let's say, or 10 million volts or 10 trillion volts. And the rest are just comparisons over the 10 trillion number in terms of the existence of the electrons. You can't make anything that doesn't have any. So anyway, I mean, that's, these are probably little baby axioms that I probably should write down somewhere. <laughs> you know, junior axioms, almost axioms, but not quite. But yes, um... If there's matter somewhere, there's an electron hanging around, pretty much. So anyway, till next time.